He, 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 he came in a quick call and I was begging, like, dude, you can't see me in there with the lady. Uh, broke out. Kevin Hart? Heard. Everybody oh, no, it's not Kevin Hart. Heard, yeah, they keep saying that, but I'm fine. All right, you can begin. Hey, T. Yeah. I heard a story, man, like, goes like this. My father has a lot of sides, and you hear about the fights. You don't hear about family that much and what that meant to him. And I remember the moment I fell in love with him when he was, uh, could make me cry. <laughs> What's your dad's name? Muhammad Ali. He would always tell me time is gonna fly. He could foresee things and knew how important those things would be. It was unbelievable the power that this man had. And the little boy said, I got leukemia. And Ollie said, I remember I told you that you are going to beat cancer and I'm going to beat George Foreman. And the little boy said, no, Muhammad, I'm going to meet God and I'm going to tell him that I know you. George Foreman, how are you doing? He whispered in my ear, that all you got, George? And that was about all I had. <laughs> This is a microphone, and when you get to be a big girl, I'm going to play this back so you can hear I was the concord of boxing. I was at a higher altitude than the rest, moving faster than the rest, but you just have to get used to riding on jets again. You can't ride concord. <laughs> he actually said, I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be better than me. How can you be better than the greatest, huh? <laughs> You just can't imagine that in the word great. It has to be another word created. I mean, who doesn't know who Muhammad Ali is? People just feel the love that emanates from him, and people can feel that. You look beautiful. I know my mother, she looked at him, and she hugged him, and then she started to cry, and she left the room. She said, well, I looked into his eyes, and I saw God. My father was always conscious about history. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why he made this series of audio tape cassette recordings of my sisters and his friends and various people. If I just got the inner circle to make a film, you know, that there may be other people who have done that. But the difference, I think the sort of differentiating factor for me was I um, discovered that Ollie himself had made some secret um, tape recordings, audio tape recordings, um, when he reti retired. And I was lucky enough to be able to use some of those in, in the film. And that formed the narrative through the film. And it's never been heard outside the family. Nobody's ever heard it outside the family. In fact, when I showed it to family a couple of months ago, a lot of them hadn't heard it. If anyone wonder why me, Muhammad Ali, uh, is making these tapes, is because history is so beautiful. Here we are with the lovely ladies of the documentary, <coughs> May May and Hannah. How are you doing, ladies? I think you. We're doing well. First of all, one of the most unique things that I thought about this documentary is when you, you your dad talked to you guys, it's like he time-stamped everything. <laughs> yeah. He gave the date, the uh -huh. day, uh -huh. the year. That's incredible. What? Why did you think that he associated a time period and mm -hmm. an exact date in a lot of the times that he spoke with you all? Man, this is a microphone. And when you get to be a big girl, I'm going to play this back so you can hear it. I'm going to say, say what I say. Say, I love my daddy. I love my daddy. I love my poo-poo head daddy. <laughs> okay. My father was always conscious about history. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why he made this series of audio tape cassette recordings of my sisters and his friends and various he people. Wanted to, he wanted us to know exactly what was going on, what was happening. There's so many recordings where, I, you know, it's like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. or 12 at midnight, and I'm waking up to go get a popsicle downstairs, and he'll make a little quick recording. It's 3 a.m., Hana. You're waking me up to go get you a popsicle. I just went down. There's no popsicles left, so now you're sending me back down to get you a pickle, signing off. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of little clips, but I think he wanted to just document everything from the time it happened to, you know, 
that's just the way he is. What's the date? Yeah. What's the time? Even with his writings, you know? <laughs> yeah, he, he, in general, he appreciated history. Mm -hmm. He really did. And, and his history was documented. Um, at, you know, when he did these tapes, he was already, what, almost 40 years old? 30-something yeah. years 1976, old? 1976, first tape. Oh, yeah, he was younger than that. But yeah. he okay. wanted to document family, friends, his parents, and he would always tell us all the time, time is so fleeting. You know, I remember you when I brought you home from the hospital, and now you're a teenager, and you're going to be married, yeah. you know, when you get older, and you're going to have kids, and I'm going to be gone, and you can listen to your history. And mm -hmm. he just, he loved personal history. He had a lot of courage. The risk he had to take and then to be isolated, to have his crown taken away, not be able to make a living, that was difficult. And to keep an attitude about himself, to keep that personality moving, even though inside he, he had to be suffering a lot. Clay now faces a nomadic existence of uncertain duration, divided between courthouses and meeting houses all over America. His occupation's gone. He seems unlikely to box again for a long time. He used to love to tape record conversations, and he would always say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tape, you guys, and when you're older, you're going to love this, 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 these tapes. And um, he would always do it. So when my parents got divorced, he would call me up, how are you doing in school? What are you doing? What do you want to be when you grow up? He would always tell me, time is going to fly. You know, I'm going to be older. I mean, he was just like he could foresee things and knew how important those things would be. to record his own legacy and yes. record the things that were going on behind the scenes at home and that people didn't know about and he would like you know he there's even recordings of him going to his trips on China you know he has to he's recording me saying goodbye telling me he has to leave and I'm begging to go with him and then he, he's actually in this, the country that he went to and he's recording the radio show that's going on and you hear about them talking about the 79 hostage crisis and the Ayatollah and you know what's going on in the government and he's recording the stuff that's going on in the world that he's doing behind the scenes to open the lines of communication with the Iran crisis in 79 and he's recording I mean his parents talking and singing right. and just beautiful just he's recording recording his own legacy and he's doing which, it for the world. Which is ironic because well. we don't hear that clear voice anymore. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Right. And, I, and my, my sister said one time, he's predicted things. I mean, he did predict the rounds, right. but I mean, he predicted what things would mean and how important things would be. So. Mm. And he, yeah, and he tells us throughout all, uh, all the recordings I'll be listening to at the end of it, you're going to thank me for this one day. Yeah. You'll be glad I did this. I'm doing this for you. You're going to thank me for this yes. one day. <laughs> he knows. You know, and he, he, he wasn't shy about telling us. Exactly. <laughs> or the world, because there's actually one recording where he talks about how this will one day be on some great radio station if they pay the price. <laughs> <laughs> and, and another good thing, that, I mean, because we got to learn and see the more personal side of your dad. Uh, right than we have seen before. And one another unique thing that I saw is that you guys were talking about how he would he would bring you all together to make sure that, that everybody knew each other and had played together. Yeah. How, how did you appreciate that? I mean, my father, up? you know, they say athletes and celebrities have all these kids. Men have a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the average Joe with 20 kids, right? Because we were talking about uh, yeah. uh, Bob Marley exactly. yesterday. And, you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of households without a father, especially mm -hmm. in minority communities. You know, uh, I think I heard some staggering statistic that like 65 or more percent, there's no dad. My father didn't want to be that person. And just because he wasn't a perfect person, or maybe a couple of his kids, he was not married to their mothers, that was no excuse not to be a father. 
Um, so he made sure we all congregated in California and visited him. And he would say, you know, we're half sisters. Mm -hmm. Her mom, you know, is Veronica. My mom is Kalila. And mm -hmm. there was some yeah. stuff going on with that. Yeah. And he said, love your sister. This is your yeah. sister. She's yeah. brought into this world. She's a beautiful <laughs> child of God. Don't yeah. resent her. Yeah. And I divorced your mom and married her mom. And he would talk to us like that. You know, at five, six, yeah. seven years old, parents don't do that. They yeah. keep their kids out of that. Yeah. Now, he kept us out of anything negative going on. Mm. Love your sister. Yeah, this is yeah. your blood. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, so yeah. I just thank my father yeah. for that because he didn't say I'm perfect, but he said, you love, you guys love each other. And his mm -hmm. wish mm -hmm. was that he lived on the hill with all his kids and their husbands yeah. and their, his grandkids. <laughs> that was his wish. Yeah. So Every summer, every one of us came to the house in L.A. where Leyline grew up, and we were so excited whenever they would come. Like, we just couldn't wait. He'd go to the airport, pick them all up, and everyone would be coming in because there was eight of us total. And they'd spend the summers. So, and when they weren't there, you know, he would call them and remind them that he loves them, that this is their house too, and I'm your dad too. You know, that tape recording, yeah. I mean, you could hear the whole thing. It's just beautiful. So yeah. he really enjoyed being a father. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that he loved most in the world, the title he loved most. And my dad also knew how important it was, I think, to make people feel loved and appreciated as children, especially mm -hmm. siblings that we have that didn't grow up. Like Mia last night lived in New Jersey. And one of my favorite stories is Mia, the, the, the woman, I think you were at the, the recording last night, the, the show, she actually called my father in tears when she was seven years old because she's so fair-skinned, she didn't look like him and he didn't live with her mother. So he, kids were teasing her saying, you know, you don't, you don't look like your dad, we never see him, you don't believe your dad's Muhammad Ali. He got on the plane the next day, flew there, went to her school, called an assembly, called, had her pick out the kids that were teasing her. They walked to the stage, he shook their hands, said, this is my, my daughter. Then he took her home at the end of the day and walked her up and down the street in the middle of the road, holding her hand so the world, the neighborhood could see them together. And that meant more to her than anything in the world. And I thought, that's the kind of father he is. He goes above and beyond and he loves being a dad. And I mean, there's nothing he wouldn't do for his kids. There's nothing he, he, he would have rather have, I mean, he would have never given up this role over anything, you know, he just loves it, he enjoys it. And the world doesn't know that and how humble he is, even though he was so proud and how yeah. much he loved, you know. You know, yeah. any family, you have sibling rivalries mm -hmm. and you have family issues. We're a normal family. We don't make it seem mm -hmm. like, oh, kumbaya, we just all love each other every day. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're just nine of us. Some some kids are closer than others, and but we have a, a general love and respect, and my father yeah. was really the catalyst for that. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys' participation in this. The documentary was was excellent, and I, I really hope everybody gets a chance to see this. Thank yes, you very thank much. You. All right, thank you, thank ladies. You. Thank you. Say, flow like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Say it, say it for that. Flow like a bee, sting like a bee. What's your daddy's name? Muhammad Ali.